This meeting is being recorded. Which comes from Proverbs 25:11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The written word is a precious treasure. We want to preserve written knowledge for God's glory and as an anchor to the history of the church and its classical conversations. We hope to encourage the reading of words and of the word. Welcome to Words Aptly Spoken, where Jennifer Courtney and I discuss a book each week from the Classical Conversations Curated Curriculum with you, our book club. This is a book club for lovers of the word made flesh. It's Thursday, March 2nd, 2023, and I'm Lee Bortons. Tonight's really special for a couple of different reasons. One, Jennifer's airplane isn't flying when it's supposed to, so she was unable to be my co-host tonight. So I appreciate any help from you book clubbers that you can give. The second is that this is our book club's uh, uh, first meeting in March, which means we have a different topic. So this month, we're highlighting resources for grammar and language. Tonight, we will be discussing Our Mother Tongue by Nancy Wilson, a classical conversation's favorite. We will take a brief break uh, next week in honor of Easter. I know it's not Easter yet, but we're going to discuss the bronze bow. We want to introduce that book to people that maybe haven't read it before because it's a perfect book to read Easter week with your family. And then we'll finish up the month with the war against grammar and teaching the classics. If you've missed any of our previous episodes or any of these for the you know, oncoming year, you can find them um, at go to leebortons.com and there's a place that says archives and it takes you to the YouTube channel where all of these are recorded. So tonight we're discussing Nancy Wilson's book on called, it's on grammar, called Our Mother Tongue. We have the privilege of having her with us. Nancy, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. We're so glad you're here. So for those of you who don't know, we host a number of other book clubs. To participate in the book clubs about nonfiction, please join me on for Unfragmented with my co-host Kevin Novak. Unfragmented actually follows Words Aptly Spoken at 8 p.m. on Thursday nights. Kevin and I discuss a book a month rather than a book a week. And for those of you that are eager to see more of The Unseen, Join me and Kirsty Gilpin at 8 p.m. on Mondays for a book club discussion around the math map curriculum. Now it's time for our war, word, word, not easy to say, and that's usually Jennifer's segment. So, Julie, are you going to play your coin? <laughs> so, Jennifer was good enough to write it right out for me her story. She's so good about telling stories about different words. And so, tonight she took a word straight from grammar the word verbum. Those of you who memorized John 1 in the Foundations curriculum or in Latin and challenged will recognize the word. Verbum literally translate as it means word. We use it in English to name the parts of speech that is verbs because it's spelled V-E-R-B-U-M. I like to think about our essentials definition. A verb is a word that asserts action, shows a state of being, or links words together. The person of Jesus, and this is Jennifer's words. I mean, she's just so thoughtful. The person of Jesus, the word made flesh, embodies all of these ideas. He acts on our behalf by coming to earth, dying and being resurrected. Jesus is all states of being, past, present, and future. He reveals himself to us as the great I am. And he revealed his identity again and again using linking verbs. Think of all the times he said things like, I am the vine, I am the branch, I am the bread, etc. So Nancy, in our mother tongue, you gave Latin roots, which is interesting because it's a book on English, but you gave Latin roots for the various parts of speech. Why did you do that? And what did you want us to learn from that? Well, the reason I did it was because our students were learning Latin starting in third grade. And though I had never studied Latin, too bad for me, <laughs> um, I, as I was researching for my grammar book, you know, all the old grammars, I collected old ones, but they would refer to this. And I thought, how perfect for my book, because I wanted to be uh, making connections for the kids to their history, to the history of English. Mm -hmm. And so it was very, I was so delighted when I came across you know, a textbook that included that. So that's why I did it. I wanted to make particularly children studying Latin to just see the connection with English. And you titled the book, Our Mother Tongue, which I'm guessing you could uh, explain to our, uh, to our book club, why is Latin part of our mother tongue? Well, it's 
so many of our words obviously came in when Rome conquered Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, so many words came in that had Latin connections or were straight across. So it's just part of our history. So in the textbook, I try to give short little snippets of the history of English to keep the kids interested. You know, grammar isn't always fascinating to them. <laughs> so I was really trying to make it interesting and trying to give handles and tools, you know, that they could appreciate. Well, I appreciate that you wrote the book for young people because it made it so that those of us were new mothers and maybe didn't have a great English background. We had our own little textbook to go through that wasn't cumbersome. It's just a delightful book and I appreciate so much you writing it. So before we go on and talk more about the book, could you introduce yourself to our listeners? You know, a lot of them, Nancy, aren't our age. They're 30, 35 year old moms, and they may not know what a spiritual mother you've been to us in the classroom oh. world. Well, thank you, first of all. Well, a little about me. Um, what part do you want to know? Anything. <laughs> Anything. So I'm married to a pastor, uh, Douglas Wilson, and he helped start a school for our children. You know, we had children and we knew they needed an education and we knew the kind we didn't want them to have. And at that time, homeschooling, we had never even heard of it. And I think it was actually getting started in different pockets around the country around the same time. But um, so we got Logos started and that led to many other things. And it's just as you start building community God actually is the one who, who does it. We didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we were just trying to provide, just like you all are, a good education for your children. Yeah. So um, I later wrote this book. I ended up writing some books for women on practical Christian living along the way and articles and had a blog and so forth. And Mother Tongue was the hardest book I ever wrote. And I bet you can believe me because it's so technical mm -hmm. and coming up with sentences and diagrams and then searching for errors and checking. And so because the book really in my mind was for homeschooling moms, because some of my friends, by this time, our kids were in junior high and high school when it finally was uh, finished. Well, actually they were probably post I'm trying to think of what year it came out. The first one. 2003 is what the Amazon publication date says. Finally done. And they were all out of school by then. But um, because it just took a very long time. But I did uh, some classes for homeschool moms. And we went through the book to check. We went through the manuscript to weed out any mistakes and make sure it all worked. But they just wanted to understand grammar so they could teach their kids. So they were younger moms. And that was the goal. Or college kids who were wanting to take Latin, but did not understand English. So it's just a catch up game for so many people who went to the government schools, um, especially after I did, I graduated from high school in 1970. We were still learning grammar. Uh, it, we were diagramming sentences and that's where I grew to love it. But later, of course, uh, no one it could name the parts of speech, much less understand all the other things about English grammar. So I hope that answers your question. But it answers lots of questions. Yes, yeah, so I think that's interesting about graduating in 1970. My husband, similarly, and I tell folks he was one of the last generation that went to what was actually called a grammar school. And I'm one of the first generation that went to an elementary school. See? Amazing. Do you have a similar story? Well, no, I just went to, my dad was in the Air Force. I went to the school on base. And so I believe it was probably just elementary school and then high, junior high and high school. Uh, but it just, and then, uh, then I went to a state university. So, and was converted in college. So even though I grew up Protestant mm -hmm. and I wasn't an unbeliever in that sense, we, yeah. I knew who Jesus was said my prayers, I wasn't really born again until uh, 1973. And so that changed everything. 
and obviously redirected my life. But at the time, I was a lit major and still love language, love reading and writing and speaking, all the things. So God just redirected all of that. Grateful I am, you can imagine. That's great. So um, can you tell us about your family and your grandkids? Sure, I'd love to. I have three children. They are all proficient writers. They got a good education by the grace of God, far better than their parents did. Uh, we had to go back to school in many ways to teach them. So they're all married. Uh, they're all uh, writers themselves. And we have 18 grandkids. Nice. And the old, let's see, we have, if I can keep it straight, a couple in grad school, uh, a few in college, a few still at Logos School, and then a newborn baby. Wow. What a blessing. What <laughs> yes, a blessing. tremendous blessing. So right now, the scenic background, uh, Doug and I are building a house, and we're living in Luke and Rachel's basement apartment while we build. So, you know, they lived in our basement, and <laughs> some of our kids did at different times. Now we're in the basement, yeah. but it's pretty posh down here. Oh, that's nice. I wonder if they say to themselves, when's mom and dad going to get out of here? They're just down there playing video games. <laughs> they have been so gracious and wonderful. And the kids, the grandkids wander down. I did put in a request that Moses wouldn't dribble the basketball upstairs during the podcast. <laughs> well, thank you so much for thinking of that. Okay, so um, before we move on to including more of our book club, I wanted to share with everybody um, something new that's happening. It's not in our normal script here. I usually do words kindly spoken um, because I want to give Nancy as much time as possible. And I need to tell you about this new thing we're doing. Starting next week, if you go to LeeBortons.com and click on the uh, archive to the YouTube station, you'll see a new playlist. We're starting a podcast, not a book club. So um, it's not live where people can just get on. It's myself with Amanda Kleist from California as the co-host. And uh, we're sponsoring this podcast or hosting it. And it's called Markers and Milestones. You know, the scriptures tell us in the New Testament to mark the race run out for us. And of course, the Old Testament is full of milestones that are to remind us of the stories to tell of God and what he's done for us. And so we chose that as our title to talk about what some folks refer to as grade 13. We've done such an amazing job. You've done a great job with these classically educated young folks. Where are they going to go next? And of course, we're so thrilled that Nancy's family started New St. Andrews. And we, there's similar Christian schools, I should say a handful of similar Christian schools across the country. But between price and trade schools and the birth rate dropping off and our, our financial crisis, there's so many things going on. And so we're looking at this as an opportunity to spread the word about Christian discipleship that's happening in all areas of academics, uh, not just in college. And so each week on Markers and Milestones, Amanda Kleist and I will be introducing to parents a new, a different type of um, academic situation as well as what kind of questions to ask to find out what is out there for our students. You know, we just tend to think they go to community college or college or they get a job, sometimes missions and military. There are so many free market opportunities where businesses are dying to pay for your kids to be part of their entrepreneur programs, their apprenticeship programs as well as church sponsoring additional programs. I don't know if any of you have heard of cathedral schools. So we'll be introducing to you a lot of different options for your children. And so I just hope that you'll stay tuned for that. And starting next week, start looking for it and share it with your friends, especially in the high school or the challenge ages. Okay, so thank you for listening to that. Here's my word horn going away. And we uh, gave that announcement instead. So now we're going to begin our conversation. And uh, Julie will en encourage folks to um, ask questions, Nancy, as well as monitor that for us. So while we're waiting for them to begin their questions and get ready, um, you kind of answered the question I had to set you up for this and that what's been your interest. You said you were a literature uh, major? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then once we got Logos started, when all three of our kids were there, 
I started teaching when our youngest was in third grade. I started teaching junior high English, seventh and eighth graders. And I had always thought I would not make a good teacher and that I would not enjoy teaching. And my husband said, I really think you should consider it. So I found out I loved it so much. <laughs> and the junior high kids with grammar are so, they really are in the right spot. Mm -hmm. So we would do, you know, diagram races on the board, things like that, where their competitiveness would come out. You know, we just had a really good time. And then I moved on to high school lit, taught American lit, Brit lit. And my daughter, Becca, later picked up Brit lit and taught that when I moved on. Um, it's such a joy to teach, as you all know. And you learn so much teaching, obviously. So it's a never ending journey of learning, relearning <laughs> and learning new things all the time. Yeah, I think your daughter, Becky, um, she's the one that wrote the book about Eve, right? Yes, Eve in Exile. Yes, Eve in Exile. Yeah, tell our audience a, a couple of sentences about that because I'd really encourage them to read it. Our church, of course, we're part of the same denomination as you. And so we've been having Bible studies around it. Good. Oh, good. Well, even exile is just a feminine, uh, excuse me, a Christian answer to feminism. It's a wonderful book. And um, she's also made a documentary about it, which is well worth watching. Uh, Canon Press, you can find it there. NSA, probably New St. Andrews College, probably has it on their website as well. Um, so, and then our younger daughter, Rachel's written a book called Yuhu, which is about identity for the Christian woman. So uh, both really helpful in this age, uh, just good, solid teaching on who we are as Christian women and what we're for. Yeah, do they collaborate with you? Oh no, <laughs> no. They, they are, uh, they're way ahead of me, Lee. <laughs> I just follow along behind cheering for them. That's great. <laughs> okay, we do, so we, okay. I was to say, we do things together. We have a feminine conference, the three of us, uh, our speakers there. We do collaborate and do things together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, yeah, if you guys want to know more about um, Nancy and her family's, the Women or Family's mission to help us be more godly wives, you can go on to YouTube. There's a number of recordings of the videos that, um, of the our lectures that they've given and the conferences they've led. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, you want to read it, Julie, from Lauren? Sure. So this, this is my daughter asking the question. So you have two generations of homeschooling okay. on here. My, she used our mother tongue. I was religious with it when we did CC, um, but she has littles, uh, preschool, well, one first year, so five mm -hmm. years old. Um, any tips for preparing young new students for learning and enjoying grammar? So young, how young? What is well, her youngest is, her oldest is five right now, so five and three, um, but I'm sure she also directs challenge A, which is our seventh graders, and I'm sure okay. she's handling some stuff there too. <laughs> Reading to your kids, obviously. Making reading and writing a big deal at home, appreciating good writing. So from the time our kids were little, we read, obviously, we just read and read and read to them. And Doug would do the big reading in the evening and he read the Chronicles of Narnia countless times to those three as they were growing up. I can still see the picture where he would lie down on the couch and the three little kids were sitting on top of him. And he read the Lord of the Rings at least twice that way to them. When they were older, of course, they weren't sitting on him <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but uh, we just remember that so fondly. I mean, our son's cheeks would get bright red during some of the battles and uh, it was just so intense. And we just had a family that was very word centered around the Bible and reading and speaking. I'm sure I corrected their grammar when they were learning how to talk. And we were drilling them with spelling for the test and all of that. So we were a home where the word was central and books, lots of books. And I'm sure that this all resounds with you all that that's I'm on your page. You do the same thing, I'm sure. 
So. But what you're really just describing is that the most natural thing you can do sharing stories with your children is the best preparation for anything in language. It really is, for yeah. sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it's all approachable. I mean, he, he God calls himself the word for a reason and he wants to invite us in to um, yes. who he is. Yeah. So I'm going to read something from our book, from your book. Well, um, uh, Julie, you can see if there's any questions for after this. So it's a quotation in your introduction. You said, because we live in a culture that wants no rules, we Christians should desire to preserve and pass on all the important tools of communication, knowing that language is a means, not an end in itself. Language is a God-given tool for our enjoyment and enrichment. It's a gift from him we must not squander or misuse, but rather glory in. Tell us more and then tell us about um, maybe some stories where you were able to apply these rich ideas with your own students. All right. Well, because we believe language is God-given and God created it, no man could do this. (laughs) Um, And so it's a living and changing and and stories and so forth just mold and shape us. So we wanted to give them the right kinds of stories, but teaching, yes, like you, the quote you read, um, the, the wheels are coming off, the rules don't exist anymore. I think I mentioned in that section, I had a friend teaching in a public school in a nearby town, and she said, sometimes I shut the door and teach grammar. It was not allowed. and. Even in math classes, uh, they would say, you know, give the child a problem and two plus two, maybe they would put five down and they wouldn't say that's wrong. They would say, well, that's interesting. No, and that's a terrible way to bring children up where they don't understand that there's actually right and wrong and the Christian faith is so clear for us. So I think language as a preserve, steward, be grateful for, um, cherish really, and enjoy. And it goes back to why I put in some of the history about the language. It's so interesting. And the the manuscripts that have been preserved by the grace of God uh, that didn't go up in flames. And when the Vikings were <laughs> destroying monasteries, you know, that there were people doing all they could to preserve and and keep these manuscripts for for us so i just think we have a duty to our children to teach them the value of speaking you know in in the classical plan after the grammar stage and dialectic and they go on to rhetoric so teaching them how to express themselves well is all part of their education That's good. So um, the new rules made me think about uh, the kind of um, companionship uh, your organization and homeschoolers have had over the last three decades. So I know that um, it used to kind of irk me whenever homeschoolers would say, well, that my child's education is going to be about what they need and what they like. And why do we need to know grammar? They just need to be able to read books. And there was, you know, a lot of times it was because they loved their child and there was a freedom that they wanted for, in homeschooling that might be rightly so. Um, but then I would read your all's uh, books and the curriculum that you were putting together at Logos and say, but but there's actually this rigor that can help you to, to enjoy more of life and more of reading. And so I think it's been interesting. I think that um, uh, the ACCS schools and the cost of conversation community gets along really well because you, your organization was about five years ahead of ours mm-hmm. and really started laying the foundation for what's it mean to be classical. And then, of course, all the Padaya stuff helping us to be Christians, too. And I think what happened is uh, in mass, families began embracing these ideas and wanting it lived out, not in the classroom, but in everything that they did with their children. So it's really been a good partnership and I'm glad that you guys did what you did. The Lord's really used you. So thank you I have that. sympathy for mothers who have a bunch of kids at home they're trying to educate because it's they don't have um, a principal, well, they might have a, a principal they can send them to <laughs> or, you know, a pink slip because they didn't do their homework. I mean, they're, 
we had those things. So it was made it easier in many ways, that division of labor. I'm just going to say it. So hats off. I understand the challenges for mom at home, providing a good education to her children. And we have seen it done remarkably well over and over again. So, um, but it's a different, it's, it is, a, you have to have a different approach when it's mom and all the kids. Mm -hmm. And thankfully that there are many resources at hand today. So. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Thank okay, you. so before we go on, let me thank our sponsor, classicalconversationsbooks.com, where the books discussed can be purchased. We have the entire 2023 Words Aptly Spoken book club calendar. That's at leebortons.com. And by each of the books in the calendar, there's a link right to the CC website. So visit and plan to join as many of our book clubs as you can. And remember, just show up. Even if you haven't read the book, um, it'll still be a fruitful conversation. And I remind you that next week, go ahead and purchase the bronze bow. Try to read it ahead of time if you can. Uh, it's a crier. It's a good book. It's one that will be life changing if you're not, um, you know, the kind of person that reads a lot of literature. This is it's an easy read and it shows why the um, books that we have in our curated curriculum are there. It's to point the children to Christ. So I encourage you to read that before next week. So are there any other questions at this point, Julie, before I keep asking mine? Um, Sherry just has something she's, I asked a question about, you know, sharing a testimony about grammar and words. Um, so she put in there, redeeming my education, English grammar, which included our mother tongue. So a testimony to you for that book. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, Nancy and it helps also, understand scripture as well. Yeah. Yes. So Nancy, you know, we use the word grammar in classical conversations, and I believe you as a classical educator do the same thing. That's got a little bit broader meaning than just English grammar or Latin grammar, mm -hmm. but the whole idea of having a grammar school where all subjects revolve around the language of that subject, and of course your mother tongue. How would you describe grammar to us? <laughs> do you mean in that context as a stage of learning? And, and that's the thing, it has a number of meanings, so uh, any of them that you want to share. Well, English grammar, of course, is just all the nuts and bolts of it. And, but the grammar stage in education, that first stage is when they're little and you're just filling them full of facts, teaching them the alphabet when they're really little and the math facts as they grow up, you know, just filling their little minds up with so much uh, information. And the next stage is when they learn to sort it all out. But I, I would say that the thing we want with grammar, with English grammar, it's not an end in itself. It's a means, you know, learn, having the tools in your tool, tool belt is never going to hurt you. You may choose to use the word or uh, write the sentence incorrectly on purpose, knowing you are for some reason, but it's just not never going to hurt you to know the answers. And we want to have a Christian worldview, not just in literature courses, which of course we emphasize, but in a grammar course. What's the Christian worldview? What do Christians believe about the word? Like the quote uh, you gave earlier, Jesus is the word. God loves words. He gave us his book. Words are important. So the Christian worldview on grammar is that it's a means of glorifying God. It's like learning different tools that you can use as you worship him, as you serve him, who knows how, how he will use it. Uh, but it could never hurt you to know, uh, mm -hmm. to have that in your, um, in your skill set. Right. Yeah, it's kind of a um, pushback on people that think education is pragmatic and utilitarian, and they don't know the beauty of just knowing things. The beauty of knowing things, but the Christian worldview, again, like when you bring that to all the reading you're doing with the kids. It's like, what is the author saying about man? What's he saying about the world? What's he saying about God? Yeah. You know that, and so we can interact. And with grammar books, unfortunately, they're full of secular <laughs> lies, modern grammar books. So you, that's why I wanted to write a Christian one where you could just um, not have to sort through the weirdness. 
Yeah, who knew there'd be weirdness in a grammar book? I know, there's plenty. There like is. The pronouns, the pronoun section, yeah. delete, right? Yeah. So you also have in your introduction um, a, a bit of a history about English and the Germanic branch and Indo-European and uh, Scandinavian Dutch. I mean, you refer to a number of countries. Could you explain to us where English comes from? Because it does have an influence besides Latin. Oh, that's, oh, no problem, Lee. Easy peace. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I enjoyed as I was writing this was just gathering information and from old grammar books and histories of English. I think I mentioned in there, we watched a documentary when the kids were little called The Story of English. It's pretty old now, but it was so excellent. And just um, the Britons were there first and then the Angles and Saxons and Jutes invaded. It's a story of war, really. And who gets to take control and then the effect on the language. So the Norman conquest, for example, brought in all these French words and the aristocracy and the uh, judicial system was they used French, but then the common people used Anglo-Saxon, you know, so they're just different phases of English that wars had a big impact on. Um, now, I think so much of what we have is being uh, chucked, just thrown away and who cares? It doesn't matter. And so I think it's, it really is a privilege for us to try to preserve something. You think about these monks who are preserving handwritten manuscripts when the Vikings were coming and burning down the, the churches, um, the monasteries. So it's our duty now to be preserving these things as well and passing them on to our children so then they can pass them on to, you know, and I'm all for language growing and changing, certainly. Mm -hmm. It's a living thing. It doesn't have to stay put. Uh, it's going to change. It's the way God made it. I'm all for that. But we want to watch out for what we are throwing overboard and what we are preserving and protecting. That's good. All right. So for those of you that haven't had a, Nancy's, a chance to go through Nancy's book, I just want to point out in her lesson one on nouns, these are the kind of examples of um, problems and explanations you would get. So there's three sentences that she begins with in nouns, uh, in the chapter on nouns. So one is, God controls the history of the world perfectly. The second is, a Christian student sees his hand in all events. And the third is, studying with this perspective provides hope and encouragement for the future. And then she gives explanations about you know, why those are the sentences that she picked and what we're supposed to be learning from them. So I think you know when you said it's a Christian book on English, uh, she thoroughly is um, uh, giving us not just the practice and examples, but the explanation come out of her love of scripture and what the word tells us about words. I'm always interested in the idea that I am is the most fundamental sentence there is and it's the name of god in every language like yahweh or i am um, in english and we couldn't speak if he hadn't named himself that right and he named then he named all the animals well he, sorry adam named all the animals god gave him that job and we're still naming and so naming is a important aspect of our language we name our children, we name our pets, we name our cities, you know, so naming is a, is a Christian uh, privilege, really, that God bestowed on Adam in the beginning. And I have thought of that many times, like, uh, when parents name a child, you know, this is a big deal. It's a privilege. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a little off track there, Lee, but... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would not so at all. Mm -mm. No. Does someone have something they want to share? A couple of people are unmuted, so I wanted to give you a chance to ask. Well, I can say something because um, I always like to talk, but um, did you have, was it intentional 
And I guess it's just from my use of it um, with my three children. And they were all, you know, across the spectrum of ages. But was it intentional that um, we're going to have a conversation about God? And kind of the sentences became secondary. Um, there, there would be a sentence that was just like, is that right? You know, and you end up having a Bible study instead of an English lesson. So was that something intentional? Um, well, I'm assuming right. yes, but. I, I don't recall at the, it was a long time ago when I wrote those, <laughs> but I'm glad that that's happening. I'm very glad it should, it definitely should happen. And you know, I will meet mothers who say, oh, my son does not like you. <laughs> because he does not like grammar. It's like, well, I'm sorry that his, you know, his problem isn't with Nancy, really. It's with, it's with something else. <laughs> but, uh, grammar is not the most popular subject, but I, I really tried to make it interesting for my students and even fun. Um, it's hard and I would, we ended up at one point, they must have been eighth graders because it was their second year, uh, the end of the year of diagramming the preamble. And that was a challenge, but it was a whole lot of fun. And they felt so, you know, smart when they were done with that. But it was, uh, it was, it was fun. So I guess it's, I really tried to instill a joy in it and that's just something each teacher has to do. Otherwise, you can just beat them over the head with grammar and no one's gonna enjoy that. <laughs> so maybe in response to Nancy's comment there about making it more enjoyable, do any of you have like a uh, grammar game that you play with your students or a fun activity you've done say in CC Foundations? Something to give the other folks um, ideas for homeschooling their children or teaching their classrooms. So while you think, because I know that you always have to think for a moment when I ask I these can give you one while they're thinking. Okay, I was yes. two students up to the blackboard and they had to face the class. And I would write a sentence on the board and say, go. And they had to turn around and whoever got it diagrammed correctly first, their team got a point. So you have to have a few kids, but you can do it with, you can even um, compete yourself, moms, with your child's. <laughs> <laughs> but we just had we had a good time with it it was sometimes hard to make it interesting and fun but I mean I probably shouldn't admit this but I actually paid my children to memorize prepositions oh that's good <laughs> we, had a list. we sang it <laughs> <laughs> yes yes <laughs> they did end up singing it because they figured that's how they could best memorize it to earn their twenty dollars but no, they earned it that's amazing. <laughs> well done. There are a lot of them. <laughs> there are a lot of them. A whole bunch. And you know, nice. I, I enjoy reading grammar books. I don't know if you all have read Eat Shoots and Leaves. Mm -hmm. That It's a very funny book. It's really for adults, but there's parts of it you could pull out for your kids that are just funny punctuation mistakes. Mm -hmm. and there are funny far side cartoons here and there about grammar. You know, I just bring those in. Why not? Have them make no. their own cartoons about grammar. <laughs> yeah, put that eat shoots and leaves in the chat so people can look that book up, Julie. That's a fun one. Yeah, Lynn Truck. Mm -hmm. It's eat, and comma, leaves. shoots, comma, or maybe there's not a comma, and leaves. I don't remember, but it's a punctuation book. And the, the title has to do with, I believe it's, is it panda bears? Yes. They eat shoots and leaves. They eat shoots and leaves. Mm -hmm. And she's just saying, if you don't punctuate it properly, the panda right. eats shoots and leaves. With a gun, right? <laughs> or Instead of, oh, uh, so I shouldn't there. have the comma after eats yeah it, she's she very eats. very witty and mm, that's funny pretty. and it's it's, a, it's been a while since i read it but i laughed quite a bit reading that one so any questions or in the chats here i see there's a few of them no. are you, you asking them questions? yeah that's just me that's just me asking 
Anyone have a burning question about grammar? No, grammar. Mm -hmm. no I am. Well, I'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on a test booklet to go with the text. So, so there are little quizzes and review tests at the end of each unit. So that's in the works, which has made me sit back down with grammar, roll up my sleeves. And so there will be a test booklet that will be available sometime in the future. Hopefully not. You know, long. that's so funny because I actually used our mother tongue a lot for assessment. So we would do our grammar, we would do, you know, the essentials um, guide. And then at home, my assessment that they were getting it was your book. Um, we would either, I would read the sentence and they would say it to me, Good. or um, mm -hmm. if I needed to do laundry, they would do a couple of the sections on their own. And then I would, you know, okay, you know, your verbs, that's very good. So that's funny that there's a need for a test booklet. That's interesting well, to me because I actually used your booklet as an assessment. Well, it's a resource. Use it any way you want. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all they all are. Okay, yeah. so then let's go back to describing the book again. Um, it does, uh, it matches up really well with our essentials program. For those who don't, aren't in classical conversations, the essentials program is our uh, uh, weekly uh, program with a tutor who's trained in English or in language, I should say, and they get together with our eight to 12 or nine to 12 year olds. Uh, and basically the way we run the seminar is it's all auditory learning that the students actually go home and do the print, the written assignments and the actual diagramming, um, as well as some other activities that uh, relate to say math, like our national number knockout. And then using the Institute for Excellence in Writing's um, theme-based books. But the reason why we wanted to have our mother tongue was just for the very reasons we started out with where Nancy was describing the purpose of the book. It's a great companion for that parent who doesn't begin to even know what some of these uh, grammatical ideas are. And then is gonna spend three years intensively working with the child um, to learn the essentials of language. So I just wanna point out the similarities so she starts out with the eight classes of words, meaning the eight parts of speech. That's what we start out with. And then she goes into the sentences as a unit on sentences and the parts of speech and how they're used in the various um, structures. And then there's a section on nouns and pronouns, which of course we have our charts where we have the students memorize those and you know the preparing in number, gender, and case for their Latin studies. And then we go on, she goes on, you know, four's got special properties of verbs. Um, verbs are always tough. There's a lot to do with principles and conjugating verbs, both in essentials and in Latin in classical conversations. So she sets you up really well there. And then, of course, there's those funny parts of speech called verbals. Um, and she's got a whole section practicing those before she goes on and ends the book with some properties of special modifiers. So it's just really a good, good book. And I'm just so thankful that we've had it all these years. I know it was very helpful in my formation of studying languages. So thank you for writing that, Nancy. Yes. Thank you. All right, I have a good question maybe to end on. Okay. Steps a little bit from grammar, but are there ways that you have seen the lack of attention to grammar negatively impact the current culture? Mm, good one. Oh my goodness, yes. For instance, how many times do you hear people start a sentence with me? <laughs> I'm, mm. you know, it's me centeredness, me centeredness. Uh, me and Tom are going hunting, you know, well, that <laughs> Tom and I are going. So there's that me centeredness. There's the, certainly I already mentioned the pronoun debacle that's happening. So as, as our culture throws away so much, so fast, it's going to take time to recover, but there's gonna be a bunch of us who still have it intact. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's a treasure. And I'm not saying we all have to have all the rules memorized. We're all, we're all English speakers, even before we know the rules, the kids are English speakers. It's an amazing gift that God has given us. So I think the, the goal is to steward it 
people might not appreciate it now, but there may be a time coming when it is a lost treasure being found again. But, yeah. but um, people that seem to make the biggest impact in the world are people who know how to use language well, correct? Yes. And so we just have to be patient and not fret, but be patient and faithful and bring up our kids to just love words, love language, uh, have fun with it, enjoy it, read it. And there will be no, um, I'm certainly not sad that I wrote that book. It's a lot of work for me, just like learning grammar is a lot of work, but I'm glad it got done. And Canon even put out a second edition. So I went through and added exercises and cleaned up some things and found some typos, you know, all <laughs> that. So I, <laughs> it's a good refresher for me. And so now writing the, the quizzes, it's another round for Nancy. Yeah. Get in there and do it again. So yeah. or it's good for my brain. Yeah, that's a good testament. You've never done learning and you can repeating is a really good idea. So could you end with something else here? Um, uh, your other, you have another writer, uh, Nathan. Uh, could you tell folks about his uh, trilogy or his books? And then he has a TV show on network, Netflix for children. Nathan is uh, our only son. He wrote Death by Living, which I heartily recommend. It's a book about the Christian life. Death by Living, and um, Notes from the Tilted World it's about a, its philosophy and the Christian perspective on each different philosophy. Then he launched his fiction, the, um, boy, I don't even know how many there are, um, but he, he's he got the a couple of different series, three, I think, three series for kids in that middle um middle, like junior high age, young, uh, what is that called? Middle readers. Mm -hmm. So there's the Ashtown series and there's the, um, the cupboard, the hundred cupboard series. Mm -hmm. And those hundred cupboards, those were his, those were his first, uh, fiction. Oh, he also wrote, um, Lee Pike Ridge, which is one of my favorites. It's so good. And it's a standalone adventure. And so you'll just, I can't even remember all the titles. He's been prolific. And, um, and it, you know, it's been a lot of fun. I, we were at one ACCS conference and there was the little boy trying to find, he had Nate's book, he wanted to get it signed. And I said, well, I'm his mom. Do you want me to sign it? He's like, no. <laughs> But I said, <laughs> I can get you to him, just come with me. And I got him over there. But I really enjoyed that, uh, the kids. But at any rate, he had, um, he has some challenges now. He had brain surgery a few years back, a brain tumor. And his, he had so many irons in the fire. He's a very productive man. But he has more challenges now than he did before, as far as being able to just produce books one after the other, but he's working very hard. He's doing great. And uh, now he's coaching basketball and track, you know, for his kids and football and he's busy on all fronts, but I hardly recommend his books as well as um, the Riot and the Dance films that he's made on creation, exploring God's creation, the Riot and the Dance. So that's great. There's my plug for Nate. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. You know, you're known by your fruit and your fruit has been rich. So thank you for joining us and we'll have you on again. Thank Good night. you. Very kind. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Nancy. Good night. Good night.